Well, hey there. This is Pastor Chris, Glory Baptist Church in Aiken, Minnesota. We had a bit of recording difficulty with the very beginning of our sermon from this week, so I'm just going to re-record that short segment here so you can hear it. We'll add that to the beginning of the rest of the video footage that came through just fine and uh, give you the full sermon for the week here. We will be in Luke 19, starting off with verse 28. You're certainly welcome to open a Bible and follow along. Now, my message today is going to be a little bit different than what you may have heard from me thus far. I want to take you on a journey back to that very first Palm Sunday. It began early one morning as Jesus was walking towards Jerusalem. Jesus had stopped for a moment, and he had sent two of his disciples ahead of him into a nearby village to carry out a specific special task for him. Here's how Luke 19 records that event. It says, Jesus went ahead, going up to Jerusalem, as he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called Mount of Olives. He sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied up there, and which no one has ever ridden. He says, Untie it, and bring it back here to me. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? Tell him, The Lord needs it. That's Luke 28-31. Now, these two disciples that Jesus tells us to, um, it would seem they probably wondered, why was Jesus asking them to do this? Because it, it seems a little out of the ordinary, frankly, when you consider uh, the ministry and travels of Jesus. Nowhere else in the accounts of Jesus' ministry does Christ ever uh, get mention of having ridden any sort of animal from place to place. We know he walked. He walked hundreds of miles, in fact, throughout Israel, but there's never any mention of him riding on anything. Anything save for uh, in a boat across the Sea of Galilee, for instance, but never, never on any animal. So, as he gives his men this, what on the surface would seem to be an odd set of instructions to go to the village to get this colt that has never been ridden, to bring it back to him, uh, it would seem that it's a little out of character and may have raised some eyebrows among the disciples. We'll, we'll, we'll be obedient. And it's interesting as we go through this, the details that Jesus gives them are very specific, right? Christ tells them these exact words. He says, this is very specific. These exact words. This is exactly, guys, what you are supposed to say when you go. If somebody bothers you, if somebody stops you, if somebody says, hey, what are you doing with that? Simply say to them, the Lord needs it. And then presumably just keep on going, right? The Lord needs it. Off you go with somebody else's donkey, right? Back in those days, you know, if you were a horse thief, bad things happen, right? Even, even in America, you get caught stealing a horse. That's not a place you want to be. And, and their sole protection is the Lord needs it. All right? Well, okay. Now, we don't know if this was a prearranged event, if Christ had already arranged for this cult or something else, but it is certainly an odd little detail that's injected there in the Scripture. And while that detail isn't completely clear, one thing that was clear was that Christ knew that he was going to be facing some tremendous and not in a good way sorts of things as he enters into Jerusalem. Christ, you see, he knew his Old Testament, right? He had studied the Word of God. He was God. He is the Word of God. But he had, as, as a child growing up, knowing the Word of God as well. And Christ knew the Old Testament prophecies. And Christ knew. He knew. His time had come. That day, nearly 2,000 years ago, Christ knew it was one of the last few he was going to have here on earth. He knew his time was short. He knew what was on the horizon. He knew his fate, what was coming. He knew what he was facing. And could you imagine yet walking into the city, knowing now what we know, knowing that Christ knew that's what was before him. Can you imagine still walking that road and walking into Jerusalem, nonetheless, knowing what was waiting? Yet, faithfully, obediently, 
Even Christ is obedient in this. He walks that road. Walking a road that leads to certain death. That is, that is one of the amazing lengths that Christ went to so that he could show us, all of us, his love. Walked right into it. Now Christ asked for this cult, right? And he asked for a cult for a very specific reason. And if you've been in church all your life, you've probably heard some of this, but it's good to review nonetheless. He didn't want a, a big stallion, right? He says, guys, go get me a colt. A young animal, right? By riding in on a colt, he was making a public proclamation that he is entering the city as a king. If you came in as a conqueror, if you came as a warrior who has just won the battle, or was going to win the battle as a conqueror, you rode the biggest, strongest, fiercest, fastest animal you could find. Because you were showing off your might. You were showing off your strength. You came in battle gear with swords and spears, everything polished, gleaming, looking like you were ready to go to war. But instead, Christ rides in on a young animal, yearling, year and a half, two, I don't know, young animal, a colt. When you ride in on a colt, rather than a stallion, the message you are sending is the battle has already been won. That's the important message for you to hear today. The important message of Easter, of everything we're going to be doing for this next week as Christians, everything we should be doing every day as Christians. The battle's already been won, folks. The battle has already been won. Christ rides in on a colt as a symbol of peace. He's already won. And he makes a powerful statement to the people of his time. But unfortunately, few, if any, understood what it was that he was saying at that point. Most of them missed it. In fact, uh, we don't really see anybody who catches it. We don't see anybody who really understands the symbology of what he is doing. Because here's the problem. You ever had a preconceived expectation of something? Something you thought was going to happen, and so you went into it looking for it, right? You ever had a question you wanted to ask, but you already had the answer in mind? We sometimes do that, don't we? All of us. And that's what kind of happened in Jerusalem. There was an expectation. The people had a preconception. They believed something was going to happen, and so when they saw him coming, they just saw what they wanted to see instead of seeing what was actually going on. Most people at the time expected Jesus to come into town conquering his enemies and leading the Jews to world power. Leading them with power and might. Conquering all who stood before them once again and restoring Israel to its place as God's chosen people. Everybody watching Jesus expects him to come in. How many of you have watched 24? Remember the TV show 24? They expect Jesus coming in like Jack Bauer, where every single day he saves the world, right? Each hour in 24 hours, Jack Bauer saves the world. If you watch 24, Jack Bauer is kind of a Christ figure. Don't take that too far. But that's who they were expecting. They were expecting like Jack Bauer on steroids, right? Body of Arnold Schwarzenegger saving the world. That's what they, they think Jesus is coming as. A revolutionary. With power and with might. But the people missed out. They didn't get what Christ was saying. Not only did they miss his symbolism of riding on a colt, but some of them had been learning from him for three and a half years, right? Th there was a group of men walking with Jesus who also missed it. They didn't see it. So that the crowds didn't see it probably shouldn't come as a surprise. Because Christ's band of merry men, his disciples, 
They too didn't see it. And they'd been learning at his feet for weeks, months, and years. They were looking for one thing, and Christ came as another. Now some in attendance on that first Palm Sunday would have seen Christ riding a colt, and they would have laughed at him probably. Here comes that crazy carpenter riding on a colt. He thinks he's a king, they would have said laughingly, right? Would have dismissed him. Now remember, if you know this passage, this was the same day that the Pharisees had complained because people had begun to worship Christ, right? And so the, they, they ask him, they said, Jesus, you've got to make this stop. This is inappropriate. People can't be worshiping you. Make it stop. What did Jesus do? He, of course, refused. And so the Pharisees immediately saw that as blasphemy. No man should be worshipped as God. They took great offense. They were already greatly offended by Jesus, but this was the last straw, right? Christ refuses, and this sealed the deal for their hatred, for their fear of Christ, putting into action what would become his crucifixion. There were also many there in the crowd that day who actually received Christ with joy, welcoming as an earthly king, praising him, expecting him to reestablish the throne of David, to, to come and to overthrow the Roman Empire. Because, as I mentioned, the Jews felt like they had been put down for long enough. They felt like it was finally their time Finally, our chance to once again regain power, to rule. There were others in the crowd as Jesus was walking into town. People Jesus would have healed. People Jesus would have fed. People who had witnessed all sorts of different miracles that he had performed. People who had listened to Christ teach when he spoke with such great authority and people whose lives had been changed. And in the middle of all the noise, all of the distraction, the hubbub surrounding his entering of the city, combined, this is a, a very busy time in Jerusalem. This is the Passover. This is the biggest day of the year, the biggest week of the year for the Jews. And people have been swarming into Jerusalem. The town bulges and swells, swells 10, 12, 15, 20 times its normal population as people come to celebrate the Passover, as people come to try to go and celebrate and worship at the temple. The town explodes with population. And so there's all sorts of noise and distraction going on. But here, in the middle of it, Luke tells us that despite all the distractions going on, that Jesus has a laser-like focus on one thing. Jesus knows what is coming. And there is no turning back. As Jesus rides down towards the gates of the city, the crowds continue to grow. More and more people hear that he's coming into town. They start pouring out into the streets. There's a festive mood in the city because of Passover. And as I mentioned, uh, Passover is this, this important, in fact, the greatest of all of the Jewish festivals. I mean, if you, if you want to understand what Passover was for the Jews at that time, imagine combining Christmas and Easter and 21st birthday all together at once. That's Passover, right? This is a big deal. You saved up money all year to be able to go to the Passover. You took time off of work. You, you planned your whole life around being able to go. To go up the hill, go up the temple for Passover. You read your Psalms, it talks about going up the hill in a number of places. That's going up the hill to Jerusalem. That's going to the temple. That's what they were doing at Passover. It was the highlight of your year. Now as I read this story, I imagine that even before Jesus arrives, the news had begun to spread recently. 
Because it was immediately before this that Jesus had healed Lazarus. You remember that story? You can imagine the excitement in some people, right? Hey, have you heard the news? Some guy, I don't know, some, some guy, I think his name was Lazarus? I don't know. Doesn't matter. There, the, there was this guy, dead, right? He died. And he was in the grave, and I mean, they could like smell his body. He'd been in the grave for days. He was getting funky. He was definitely dead. And then this dude, this Jesus guy, you heard about him? I heard this Jesus guy, he, he goes, he sticks his head in the tomb a little bit, says, Lazarus, come out. Right? Everybody's looking at each other going, what's going on here? How comes Lazarus? Grave clothes on. This guy's been dead. And he just spoke him to life. I saw it. Can you believe that? Can you imagine that spreading through the crowds? That the guy who had just called Lazarus out was coming into town. I think he might be the Messiah. Let's go check this guy out. There's something going on. So the news travels from person to person. And finally, when Jesus is ready to enter into the city, great crowds are collecting on either side of the street, both sides of the road. And there they were. They had cut some palm branches, right? We have some palm branches around. There's some palm branches as you exit if you want one. And the people are shouting, Hosanna! Hosanna to the king! And excitement prevails throughout the whole city. Now the palm branch, the palm branch that they were cutting down from the trees and they were waving, is a symbol of triumph, of victory in Jewish tradition. And so here they are, waving. And then they're taking off their coats, throwing them on the road, right? So he can go across. Throwing their coat, coat on the ground so the colt can walk across to honor Christ. Waving palm branches, throwing their coats. Now in the crowd that day, there were also people who loved Jesus. Perhaps Bartimaeus was there. You know who Bartimaeus was? Bartimaeus was that blind beggar who Jesus had restored his sight. So maybe Bartimaeus is there that day, no longer in his raggedy beggar clothes. Bartimaeus was a guy everybody knew in town who couldn't see his whole life. Now, here he is standing on the side of the street going, look, right? He was blind. That's a joke. Bartimaeus is saying, look, here comes the one who healed me. That is the Jesus. That is the Messiah. How about Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus was probably there. Probably still struggling to see. But at this point, Zacchaeus had probably paid back his debt. Paid back what he owed society, what he had basically stolen and robbed from them. Can you imagine there was probably some former lepers in the crowd? Remember the story of the men that Jesus had healed? One of them came back and thanked him. The rest of them just ran off. But if you're standing next to a guy and you know this guy used to be a leper and now he's not, I want to hear that story, right? How did this happen? It was Jesus. Well, I need to find out more about this Jesus then if he's healing you like that. They were cleansed and now rejoicing. Maybe Jairus' daughter was there. You remember Jairus? This is the little girl that Jesus had brought back to life after experiencing death. So you got Lazarus, you got Mary, you got Martha. They were undoubtedly all there. People whose lives had been tremendously changed by Christ. 
And they undoubtedly had love in their hearts. And they were all there to support Christ. This wasn't just a pep rally, however. This wasn't a pep rally for Jesus. Because as I mentioned, also in the crowd that day were the Sadducees and the Pharisees. They were supposed to be the keepers of the law, the spiritual leaders. But Jesus had gained so much popularity, they now felt threatened. So, full of jealousy, they stand there among the crowds watching Jesus enter the city as well. You know who else was there that day? There was Romans. Particularly, a lot of Roman soldiers. The Passover was a scary time if you were a Roman soldier. Scary because this was the time where the most people came together and within that was the fear of revolt. When people gather, some of you are old enough to remember Tiananmen Square in China, right? When people gather against the will of their government, it scares and threatens governments that aren't democracies. The leaders feel intimidated. And the Romans knew that Passover was one of those times where things could get out of hand. So they would send extra soldiers this time of year just in case somebody was going to get out of line. If they needed to crack some skulls, the soldiers were there. Waiting. Wondering if they were going to have to crush an uprising. Jesus realized as he enters the city, listening to the Hosannas, as he's riding into town, that soon the sinister voices are going to drown out those that were praising him. Today they're cheering for me. But a week from now, there's going to be a whole bunch of people who are cheering against me. What a difference a week can make. I often find myself wondering as I read the story, how are the apostles reacting to all of this? Now, I suspect Judas. Judas was pretty ecstatic about what was going on, right? Judas is basking in the reflected glory as he follows Christ into town because Judas, as we know, wanted an earthly kingdom more than any of the others. And so Judas walking in, seeing his leader get praise, is by default hanging out with him, thinking, this is good for me. I imagine as Peter walks, right? Peter's such a great character in the New Testament. I can just see Peter kind of walking, kind of chest puffed up, right? Because he's getting to roll with Jesus. He's getting to hang out with this guy. He's enjoying the throngs and the cheers of the crowd, right? But Peter being Peter, while he feels pretty good about it, he's walking with one hand on that sword just in case, right? The sword that he's going to use in just a few days to lop off somebody's ear. But maybe Peter is thinking to himself, at last, finally, we're going to get what we deserve. Here's the thing you should hear in the story, though. The good news of the gospel is Peter never gets what he deserves. Right? Peter never got what he truly deserved. But instead, he got forgiveness. Now, of course, Thomas was with him. Imagine Thomas. He might have been a little bit skeptical about everything that was going on. A little bit of doubt. Wondering what's going to happen next. Or how about James and John, right? We got a couple of stories in the New Testament about James and John specifically. As they're walking with Jesus, as they're walking in and people are crying out thinking that he's the king. James and John are walking behind him, elbowing each other, going, I'm going to be his right hand man, right? No, it's my turn this year. Which one of us is going to be greatest? Right? They were all there in Jerusalem. 
loving faces, sinister faces, anxious apostles, people, crowds crushing to see him, straining against each other to be near him. When all of a sudden, as we read the scripture, Jesus stopped. He'd been progressing into town and he stops. Have you ever, I used to live in the Twin Cities. You ever been in rush hour traffic in the Twin Cities when in the middle lane a car breaks down? 494, 394, 694, 94, something that ends in four. Any of those roads. And in the middle lane a car breaks down in rush hour traffic. Right? I've been there. And cars start to stack up and back up. Right? It's like a chain reaction. And, and sometimes that chain reaction is a bad chain reaction because pretty soon you'll see like 12 cars pulled over to the side of the road and they're all a couple inches shorter than they originally were. Right? One of the joys of living in the metro. Joys. I mean, it's, 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 it's almost like watching a Three Stooges video because it's like... I mean, just down the line. They run into each other like dominoes. And and of course, you can hear the people when Jesus stops, right? Use your imagination. You can hear the people further back in line going, running into one another going, what's going on here? What's the holdup? Get moving. We got places to go. I got to get into town. I got to get to the temple. I got to go get my sacrifices done or I got to get to the place we're staying or I got to go get some lunch or why why aren't you guys moving on? And somewhere like, you know, seven cars back, there's a guy on a 2007 donkey trying to honk a horn, right? And keep moving. But the people, the people who were close to Jesus, the people who could actually see Jesus, they realized it was Christ who had stopped the procession. It was Christ who had stopped the parade. And those who were paying attention to him saw his body begin to shake. Maybe at first that some of the people might have thought he was going to be laughing. There's a little... little you know, motion going to his body. Maybe he's giggling. Maybe he's laughing. Maybe he's sharing in the joy, right? No. For those who could see his face, they saw no evidence of laughter. Scripture tells us that they saw sorrow and tears on Jesus' face as he's entering into Jerusalem. He wasn't laughing. He was crying. The Gospels tell us that Jesus reacted emotionally in a number of places, but only in two places does it ever speak about him weeping. He reacts when he sees the hunger. He reacts when he sees the poor. He reacts when he sees people sinning. He reacts when people are ill. And it repeatedly says, and Jesus had compassion upon them. But only twice does it ever say, that Jesus cried. One time he cry, cried at the grave of Lazarus, right? You remember? Mary and Martha both are weeping. And it says that Jesus wept with them. He wept with them. He entered into their grief with compassion. And he identified with their sorrow, with their pain, and with their loss. Because Lazarus was his friend too. And this was the second occasion. Jesus looks at the city of Jerusalem. Jesus sees the crowd. And he realizes the emptiness of their lives. They hadn't heard his message of peace. They didn't understand. They had no clue why Jesus was coming. Listen as I read to you Luke 19, 41 through 44. It says there, it says that as Jesus approached Jerusalem, he saw the city. And there, it says he wept over it. Tears falling down his face. And he said, if you, even you, had only known on this day If you had only known on this day what would bring you peace. But now, now it's hidden. 
The days will come upon you when your enemies are going to build an embankment against you. They're going to encircle you and hem you in on every side, Jesus says. And it says that he will dash you against the ground. They will dash you against the ground. You and your children within your walls. And they will not leave one stone on another. Because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Wow. They had eyes, but they didn't see. They had ears, but they didn't hear. They missed the whole point of the message that God was giving them. And ironically, they stood there waving palm branches, showing that they didn't understand. They were cheering for the wrong type of victory. They were saying they were ready to pick up their swords, ready to grab their shields, ready to go to war. If he would only lead them, but Jesus said, I didn't come for that purpose. I came to show you a more excellent way. I came to show you the way of love. Jesus told us, love your enemies. Invite them to church next Sunday. Love your enemies. Love those who persecute you. If somebody strikes you on the cheek, turn the other one to them also. If somebody wants your coat, right, give them your shirt as well. If somebody commands you to carry their pack a mile, you pick it up and you take it two miles. Not what the world expected. It's not what our world expects either. Those people who listened to him, must have thought, well, those are beautiful words, Jesus, right? But surely he doesn't mean we need to do that with Rome. I mean, he doesn't expect us to love Rome, does he? Only a lunatic would command us to love Rome. I mean, we can't love Rome. Let me tell you something, though. We all have a Rome. We all have a Nineveh. We all have somebody. You don't really expect me to love them, do you, Jesus? Somebody who's hurt us. Somebody who's betrayed us. Abandoned us. Lied to us. Lied about us. Stolen from us. Ripped us off. Cheated us. Left us for dead. Wished we were dead. We all have a Rome. But Rome has not seen the power of love. Show your enemies love. Show them love was the message of Jesus. The nation of Israel had the opportunity to show the world something new, something different. But because they didn't understand Jesus, because they completely misunderstood his mission, we find Jesus weeping over them. Because the opportunity was now going to be lost and gone. And they would never, ever have it again. These were God's people. God's chosen people. God had loved them. He had led them through the wilderness. He had provided tremendously for them. Brought them to the promised land. But here, they didn't understand the Messiah when he walked among them. And because of that, Jesus wept. Today, just like the city of Jerusalem, we find ourselves in, a, in the presence of Jesus, each and every one of us, if we're here today. And I wonder what he finds when he looks at our faces. Does he see people more concerned about so many unimportant things? Worried about income taxes? Worried about job security? Worried about our health? Or does he see people who are just so busy doing things here, doing things there, that we're distracted from the things that are actually eternally important? People so busy that they never bother to see what is going on. 
so distracted by day-to-day life that they forget to stop and worship him? Or does he actually see people who recognize him for who he is? When he looks at us today, does he see a people who see the Messiah? Does he see us as seeing him as the Christ, the Son of God, as our Savior? Folks, every day, we have the choice to choose to turn towards Jesus. Every day, we get the opportunity to follow him more closely or to fall further away. So what are you going to choose this, this day? What are you going to choose this week, this month, this year? Will you be counted among those who caused Christ to weep? Or will you be among those who will one day hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Well done. 2,000 years ago, they waved their palms for Christ. Today, we can do the same. Only we have an advantage. We know what sort of victory he brought. Victory over death. Victory over despair. Victory over hatred and all the different forms of sin. Folks, that victory was for us. That victory was for our freedom. So grab it. Take hold of it. Embrace it. Then share it. Share Christ's love with the world around you. Love others well. Especially when they don't deserve it. Especially when they don't expect it. Because that is how Christ loves us. Let's pray.